Hi everyone, this is the first of probably five recorded sessions to provide a quick resource for the general ultrasound component of the DDU exam, and therefore pretty much a quick resource for all the ICU general ultrasound that you'll need. Um, you'll definitely get a Viva question on general ultrasound, and so it's worth spending a bit of time making sure you know the basics. We'll aim to cover topics including lung, abdominal, biliary, renal, trauma, neuro and vascular ultrasound, including vexus. But the first topic we'll be dis discussing is neuro ultrasound, including optic nerve sheath diameter, transcranial Doppler and lumbar puncture, as this is probably the area that people are least familiar with. Although this topic probably seems a little bit daunting, most of the skills are actually quite straightforward, particularly for people with experience in echo, and really just needs a little bit of practice to get your head around. Firstly, we'll talk about optic nerve sheath diameter. Essentially, the aim of this is to identify papilledema edema in people with raised intracranial pressure. The optic nerve is encased within a dural sheath with the subarachnoid space extending between the two. Because the area within the sheath is in continuity with the subarachnoid space, in cases of raised ICP, the sheath will expand, and this is something that you can therefore measure with point-of-care ultrasound. For this, we'll be using the high-frequency linear transducer, and ideally, we'll be using an optic preset. So optic ultrasound does carry a theoretical risk of damage to the eye, so it's important to use a preset with a low thermal and mechanical index and to minimize the time taken for the scan, if possible. You should be very liberal with the gel, essentially filling the entire recess within the bony orbit with gel, and try not to put any direct pressure on the eye as it can be really uncomfortable. As with any type of ultrasound, you need to stabilize your hand and the nearby structures are the nose or the bony orbit. And if your patient's awake, then ask them to keep their eye closed at all times and look directly ahead. This is an example of the anatomy you usually see. So the lens is seen anteriorly with the posterior chamber seen as a like, hypoechoic round structure. At the back of the eye is the retina with the optic nerve sheath extending into the far field as a hypoechoic stripe. This is then surrounded on either side by the optic nerve sheath, which has a slightly brighter echogenicity and once again has a then has a slightly darker border on the outside. It's really important when you're doing measurements so you can very clearly see these 2D structures. I'll show you some examples in a bit where you can't. Um, it's very easy with, um, with optic nerve sheath ultrasound to have off-axis imaging. And instead of seeing the optic nerve, you can actually just have acoustic shadowing, which can give you falsely elevated measurements. You can also use color Doppler to show the central retinal artery. So not only does this make sure that you're measuring the correct structure, but also clearly shows the direction of the optic nerve and ensures that the measurements you're taking are perpendicular to this. This graphic emphasizes the location of these structures and where to perform the measurements. So to make the optic nerve sheath diameter measurement, you first need to measure three millimeters back from the optic disc and ideally try to follow this in the, in the same direction as the optic nerve is going. You can see that this image is slightly off axis, but the vertical measurement has been taken following that direction of the optic nerve. Then measure the outer edge to the outer edge of the optic nerve sheath. So that's measuring from this point to this point, trying not to include the hypoechoic region on the outside of this. I would then also normally perform the same measurement in a transverse and sagittal plane and take an average of the two. The image on the left is an example of a dilated optic nerve sheath in a patient with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The measurement has been made three millimeters down from the optic disc and measures 6.3 millimeters. Recommendations vary about what threshold to use to say the ICP is elevated, with some studies using over 5 millimetres and others using over 6 millimetres. Obviously, over 5 will have better sensitivity at the cost of specificity and vice versa. A recent meta-analysis has hedged its bets, suggesting that somewhere between over 5 to 5.7 millimetres equates to an ICP of greater than 20 millimetres of mercury. The image on the right demonstrates another finding in papilledema, that is optic disc elevation, and that is seen just here. 
Theoretically, a distance of over 0.6 millimeters is elevated, but clearly this is an extremely small measurement and it's likely just to be better to visually record an elevated optic disc rather than trying to quantify. Unfortunately, it is really easy to make errors when using this measurement. These are just two examples of images from websites or journals that I found online. And the image on the left doesn't show the 2D anatomy very well at all. And it's actually probably measuring the acoustic shadow as evidenced by the fact that there is progressive widening of the hypoechoic region in the far field. Similarly, the image on the right is off axis with a measurement not really made perpendicularly to the direction of the optic nerve. And again, I'm not convinced that you can really see the sheath very well here. Now let's move on to talk about transcranial Doppler. TCD is gaining popularity in the world of POCUS and is very interesting as it actually enables you to visualize and assess flow characteristics of blood within the circle of Willis. Main indications are to recognize an absence of flow in ischemic stroke, diagnosing vasospasm after aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, and recognizing abnormal flow patterns in raised ICP. Formal, comprehensive TCD uses multiple imaging windows, including the temporal, orbital, occipital, and submandibular windows, all to build a picture of the entire circle of Willis. But normally in POCUS, we only tend to use the temporal window. For this, you need to use a low frequency phased array probe, the same as when you're doing echo, but this time using a TCD preset. Keep your patient positioned supine or with head slightly elevated, and your display marker on the screen should be on the left hand side, which again is different from echo. Initially set your depth to around five centimeters and place the probe anterior to the tragus with the probe marker pointing upwards with around a 20 degree upward tilt. You really need to move the probe around with very, very fine movements to try and identify this small temporal window. Um, and unfortunately, around 10% of people, the temporal bone is just too thick to allow a window to be found. Um, and this is particularly the case in slightly older patients. This is just a graphic demonstrating how varied the temporal window can be in different individuals and that you may have to move the probe around quite significantly to try and find a view. So when you put the probe on, what are your landmarks? Well, firstly, you're going to be looking for bony landmarks. And in this image, you can see this, the hyperechoic landmarks of on the left, the petrous ridge, and on the right, the sphenoid bone. And in the middle of these is a carotid siphon, which is a U or an S shaped part to the ICA, which tends to vary in size with age. From this view, you may also see the sphenoparietal and the superior petrosal sinuses with blue blood flow, i.e. blood flow moving away from the probe. From this view, we're going to slowly angle the ultrasound beam upwards or more cranially with color Doppler left on the screen. The main landmark you're now looking for is a large red middle cerebral artery that will be flowing up towards the probe. This is called the mesencephalic plane and it gives you excellent visualization of the MCA, the ACA, and the PCA, which wraps around the brainstem, which is described as having somewhat of a butterfly appearance. Here, you can also see the contralateral MCA on the other side of the brainstem. After you get this view, you then press the pulse wave Doppler button and place it within the MCA. If you're using the TCD preset, then the machine will probably automatically now measure the mean velocity and the pulse fertility index, which are the key values that we want to find. I know for sure that the GE Venue ultrasound, which is probably one of the most commonly used machines in the ICU, particularly ones that I've worked in, has a TCD preset and will automatically measure all of this for you. This is just a slightly cleaner example, again, of a tracing that's not automatically done, of the MCA flow. And again, it will automatically calculate the mean velocity, which in this case is 42 centimeters per second. So talking about the different causes of abnormalities with TCD, um, the first one here I've talked about is ischemic stroke. Now, um, this is probably the least useful um, etiology for me, but 
um, is commonly uh, described. And clearly an infarction will lead to an absence of color flow within the MCA. Um, and deciding that this is genuinely a stroke versus just not being able to find the image is clearly going to be challenging if you haven't done this for very long. Um, but comparing both sides can be helpful, particularly if you can see contralateral flow in a window that you're using. And interestingly, some pre-hospital emergency medicine systems have actually integrated TCD into thrombolysis decisions, which based on the experience I have is slightly scary, but um, it is described nonetheless. And there's actually an interesting case of stroke that was diagnosed at just under 6,000 meters in Tibet um, with a, a Sherpa who unfortunately had a stroke when the main differential diagnosis was high altitude cerebral edema. But clearly this would not replace urgent CT imaging in, in stroke centers. Now onto a slightly more um, commonly used method. So vasospasm is um, a complication that can be seen in you know, up to two thirds of, of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhages. And uh, clearly the gold standard for diagnosis is not going to be TCD, it's digital subtraction and geography. But in some senses, this really isn't performed very often and you can lead to empirical blood pressure augmentation therapy using lots and lots of catecholamines, which may be harmful for the patient. And actually TCD is reported as being really quite sensitive for MCA vasospasm, but is clearly operator dependent um, as with all ultrasound modalities. And there are lots and lots of confounders that uh, may alter your result. So the key finding we're going to be looking for is a raise in the mean flow velocity. So the left image is the one you've already seen showing normal flow velocity which is anywhere around 55 centimeters a second is normal. And then as you develop vasospasm, the flow rate accelerates and therefore you have much higher mean velocities. And um, you can grade mild, moderate and severe based on the flow velocity within the, the mean flow velocity within the MCA. However, many of our patients have multiple other pathologies going on that may lead to hyperemic states. So for example, someone with septic shock may have a hyperdynamic circulation leading to high mean velocities even in the absence of vasospasm. So the solution to this is to compare the MCA blood flow to the carotid artery blood flow, termed the Lindegard ratio which has been described by either using the TCD view of the ICA between the petrous ridge and the sphenoid bone, as shown earlier, or by actually using the internal carotid flow measured with a linear probe in the neck. Now, if you're doing it this way, it's really important to make sure you're measuring the internal, not the external carotids, as they, they do have a slightly different blood flow profile. By dividing the mean velocity of the MCA flow by the ICA flow, you get the Lindegard ratio. Less than three means that there is less difference between the ICA and the MCA flow, and therefore the patient is likely to be hyperemic. If it's greater than three, then there's a greater difference between the MCA and the ICA, and therefore it's more likely to represent an MCA vasospasm. So the last pathology I'll talk about is raised intracranial pressure. As the ICP rises and cerebral perfusion falls, the diastolic flow is the flow that's impeded. So this appears as a progressive fall in the diastolic flow trace that you are going to measure automatically using your machine. So the numeric applied to this is the pulsatility index, and it's the difference between the systolic and the diastolic flow. And that's then divided by the mean velocity. And the normal value is um, 0.8 to 1.2. And the number will increase with the severity of flow dysfunction. Um, now, there is this equation that you see written um, where you can estimate what the ICP is based upon the pulsatility index. Now, it's not something I've ever actually seen used clinically, but um, you do see it um, around, so it's worth noting. Now, this can actually also be used to inform specialty decisions. Um, and a particular note um, was when I worked in a pediatric uh, liver transplant intensive care unit, where the pulsatility index was part of a um, daily test for patients with hepatic encephalopathy. And with a rise in the ICP, you saw a rise in the pulsatility index. And this was used alongside other parameters to determine whether or not these people needed to um, have a liver transplant expedited.
So gradually you get a loss of this diastolic flow until this may actually be lost. And then later on, if the pressure continues to increase, then the flow may be reversed. This is called a cerebral circulatory arrest. These are two examples that you can see where here there's discontinuation of diastolic flow with just some very small amount of forward flow, followed by um, worsening of the ICP and diastolic flow reversal and cerebral circulatory arrest. Last thing we're going to talk about is lumbar puncture. So this is not something that's performed very often, particularly in the intensive care unit, um, but people may see it in obstetric anesthetics and it can get you out of trouble, particularly in patients with a high BMI. You can really use it in either the sitting or the left lateral position, and typically you use the curvilinear probe. Um, sometimes in paediatrics, the linear transducer can be used, but for adults, um, clearly this depth wouldn't be sufficient. Firstly, the back should be palpated and the level that you want to do the lumbar puncture identified. The probe is placed on in the sagittal plane, um, roughly where you think the midline is, and the spinous processes should be visible as a superficial hyperechoic structure with post-acoustic shadowing. As the ultrasound can't pass through this any further, only artifact will be seen deep to this. The next step is to move the probe one to two centimeters laterally, either side of the midline. And then this will show the articular processes, which appear like a hyperechoic camel hump causing a post acoustic shadow. The next step is the shiny ultrasound being back towards the midline. Here you can see the tail of the probe is tilted downwards to shine the beam back upwards towards the midline. The rounded articular processes have now turned into a more sawtooth pattern, and these are the laminar processes. Here you can then see directly into the intrathecal space with the anterior and posterior complexes um, at the near field and far field of the intrathecal space. In this image, the anterior and posterior complexes are incorrectly labeled and they should be the other way around. With this view, you can actually perform an in-plane lumbar puncture if you're really struggling to, to perform the procedure. Some people, however, prefer to use the transverse plane rather than the sagittal plane. And here you can see the shallow spinous processes in the center of the screen with posterior acoustic shadowing. Then with small movements between the spinous processes, you can see the interspinous ligament and then all the way down in, into the intrathecal space with the anterior and the posterior complex bordering it. Using this technique, you can't really do in-plane insertion, but it is very useful for mapping anatomy, such as the midline and depth of intrathecal space. Thanks very much for listening. If you have any questions, there's my email address. And the next session, we'll be going back to talk about the basics and some advanced features in lung ultrasound.